Hi, uh, this is Garima, and uh, with me is uh, Ravi, and uh, we are going to uh, lead the conversation with you today. We've just watched this wonderful, wonderful film, and I could hear a lot of sniffles in the audience. And uh, you know, uh, even for me, this is the third time I'm watching it, uh, but it's always a very intensely emotional experience. Uh, so I'll uh, ask uh, Ravi to uh, start with his questions. Thanks, uh, Garima. Nice to see you, meet you, Shonak, online. I'm one upon Garima. It's the fourth time I'm watching it, uh, twice at BIC. You were kind enough to allow us to uh, screen it as part of the coexistence uh, uh, exhibition earlier this year. Yes. And then yes. I watched once more on my laptop just to prepare for today. Um, well, uh, Garima mentioned about the sniffles. There was also a lot of applause, um, not just at the end. Uh, people who were, I think, uh, as Garima said, discovering layers and layers of meaning as we watched the film. Uh, let me begin with the title. What was the inspiration? What made you give the title that you've given for this film? Well, uh, to begin with, I just want to thank the organizers and thank you for um, the screening. And it's very nice to speak to experts, actually. Uh, in terms of the title, so uh, the thing is that obviously the effort was to make the film sort of larger than just be the story of a bird hospital or two brothers, but make it kind of zoom out and because the brothers themselves are very contemplative and meditative people and so much of their life is spent in thinking about a kind of simultaneity or kinship or entanglement between human and non-human um, species and I wanted a title that's able to sort of uh, capture that broader kind of neighborliness and the line comes from something that the brothers say that their mother used to say that you can't hierarchize between different life forms and the truth is if somebody said that to me randomly I would dismiss it as some kind of highfalutin gobbledygook but the brothers themselves are just so, they you can see that they concretely conduct their lives according to this kind of a maxim. There is a kind of a radical care that um, if you just described to somebody it would sound like some, would sound like hogwash. But when you see them, it has a kind of blunt force. So I wanted a kind of title that's able to transcend the vagaries of the specific, you know, world that they live in and become about their philosophical life worlds. Thanks. How did you discover the story? So the thing is that I always knew that I was interested in, um, you know, when you live in Delhi, the uh, winter months, especially kind of you're constantly preoccupied with the air one way or the other, right? So uh, what usually happens is that uh, there's this kind of a gray monochromatic haze that laminates every aspect of your life. And you're always sort of thinking of the tone or texture of life in one way or the other. And I was very taken by what it means when, you know, it feels like the, the world itself feels like it's gone awry and a bit hostile to your sense of sustenance. And I was aesthetically interested in this pervasively hazy gray skies with these lazy black dots gliding in the sky, which are the black kites. And I wanted to do something on it. And I was, uh, if I had to pinpoint one moment, I was sat in my car in a traffic jam and I got the distinct impression that I saw one of these black dots sort of hurtle down and like fall down. And I was really gripped by what happens with uh, a bird that falls off a polluted sky. So I literally took out my phone and Googled the same. And the work of the brothers came up and I randomly just cold messaged them on Facebook. And then I went to meet them. The other background to this is that I was doing this fellowship in the UK, in Cambridge, where I was housed in the around people who were working on human, non-human relationships. And I was very, and you know, like somebody was working on wolves in Chernobyl, somebody was working on uh, vegetation, Fukushima. So I was very interested in thinking of the more than human, you know, a perspective that looks at the human as not the absolute reference point, but a kind of um, relational entanglement between human and non-human species. And that kind of augmented my purview of how to think of the world. And then once you meet the brothers, the that tiny grubby derelict space is just so cinematic. And, uh, you know, it's just so, 
it and then a film often is a kind of a free fall you know you've sort of jumped off a cliff and then you're in this fever dream and before you know it it's like three years of constant slow accretion of material so i think that's where it initially began but it's really impossible to put a finger on exactly where i think the film started taking shape yeah there you go so uh you mentioned that uh, it's a very contemplative film and you know that's obvious right from the opening scene there's a very lyrical poetic quality about it and it forces the viewer to sort of slow down and really you know get swept in in that narrative of the film uh, can you talk a little more about the creative process and what led you to adopt this kind of a style uh, throughout the film Sure. So um, I, I was mentioning that the brothers are very contemplative and meditative people. And the thing is that, uh, so the first four or five months, I was shooting it like any other Verite documentary. You know, I was handheld. I didn't even have too many resources. And so I, was, I had the camera in my hand and I was just like, you know, like a run and gun kind of a raw, grimy approach. And there the logic is that, you know, if a character moves and the camera just follows them, right? So it's like, that's how you're shooting. Except that what happened was that within four or five months of shooting in this sort of a style, it became clear to me that the material was feeling really restless and edgy. And, you know, it was feeling this style helps with, say, when you want really raw imagery, be it with action or with like deep emotion character or something. But the character, my characters were not restless. They were very, very calm and contemplative for the, you know, that was their vibe. So in order for the form to uh, be concomitant with the content, I needed to find, so I then sort of put it on a tripod. Then increasingly I realized that I had to play with the tools of fiction to tell this nonfiction story. So usually toys like, a, you know, a track or a crane, all of that is not used in a documentary. But I used it because I wanted the outer shell of it to be like a, fiction film but obviously the heart of it is a non-fiction film and that's how the form slowly emerged and then I realized that the brothers are just so incredibly smart and philosophical like that like philosophers of the urban I needed a form that allowed them to just speak their cleverest thoughts literally and that's why the voiceover form came to be to also allow me to firstly I needed to access the past when how they initially came in touch with you know started this life where it felt like a love story about two brothers and a bird where uh, these brothers fall in love with this almost enchanting otherworldly wondrous bird that looks like a alien with glass reptilian eyes that's their first um, uh, memory of it so I in order to kind of capture that you needed the voice over form and other than that the Style of it is obviously an amalgamation of the shooting, which is of the our wonderful DOPs. And uh, our edit, I cut with somebody called uh, Charlotte Bengtson in Copenhagen, where we chanced upon this style of these long takes and this kind of an essayistic <clears throat> style. So that it feels more creative than a journalistic documentary. Right. Thanks. So uh, there's a quote that uh, says that... Uh, in order to see birds, it is necessary to become part of the silence. And watching this film, I felt like it felt like the camera was sort of invisible. And mm -hmm. um, it almost felt like, you know, the audience is intruding into the private lives of these characters and mm -hmm. felt almost voyeuristic, <clears throat> uh, a little bit like the process of watching birds. Uh, I'm a bird watcher. And so that analogy sort of occurred to me. But um, how did you pull this off? How did you make the characters so comfortable with the camera following them around uh, that they were able to express, you know, their innermost thoughts uh, without appearing self-conscious? Okay, well, there's two. Just one second, Shana, if I may add to what Garima said. How much of this is scripted and how much of this is just captured as you go along? So there's two aspects to that question. Firstly, the thing is that, of course, filmmaking and philosophically speaking filmmaking is inherently ornithological in that just like in bird watching you have to kind of you know slow down decelerate and subtract yourself 
you know, not wear bright clothes, not do quick movements, just sit and have a kind of a radical attention. Um, filmmaking is also that kind of a process where you're just sort of receding into the wallpaper of their lives and um, just showing up every day and in slow dribbles, trying to collect snatches of everyday life because the main ambition is to get a sense of everydayness, uh, you know, material that is soaked in mundane banality, right? That's the main kind of aspiration. And um, in terms of how one gets them, you know, it's really a function of time. The first one month is usually trash. It's usually junk because everybody is very conscious and, you know, they're very uh, stilted and, uh, you know, very uh, conscious of how they're curating their the self that they're projecting. But if you keep shooting real life sort of, uh, you know, breaks in with a blunt force and essentially uh, after the joke within the crew is that on the after a month, you know, you get the first yawn or the first gali or the first, you know, and you want that kind of realness to kind of, because that's what you want. You want shoulders to be slumped. You want eyes to not be dilated. You want jaws to be slacked. You want that sense of normalcy and realness, right? So it's really, if I, if I shoot anybody, if I shoot anybody in the audience for three full years, we shot the film for three years, afterwards, you will get a graph. You will, will get authentic behavior. You will get a quality of time where characters are being instead of behaving and that's what you want in terms of scriptedness nothing in terms of the interaction of the people itself is ever like i you can't tell them what because it gets to this thing but the voiceover bits what i did was like was collecting literally intelligent things that they were saying in a diary which was growing thicker and then at the end i realized i needed a stylized a kind of stylistic uh, lyrical device so i literally like uh, recorded in a studio session, neatly polished versions of what they had said earlier. So that to some degree was uh, scripted, the voiceover, but it was like piggybacking on material that they had already said. But uh, that apart, uh, everything else is as raw and unvarnished as it can be. The comfort is really an utterly a function of just pure time. Just like letting the camera roll for uh, quite literally three years. Just to follow up on that, I mean, I had two specific images from the film which made me ask the scripted question. One is this cardboard box, a uh, pile of three, one, the kite shakes and it falls off. Where you, I mean, where you're just filming and it happened to capture that. And then there's a man, they, they're saying cheers because they got FCRA and a man just walks through the frame and washes a shirt or something in rainwater. Uh, yeah. I mean, all, <clears throat> did these things just happen? I mean, of course they happen. You're particularly citing those things which are instances of, you know, non-fiction film is an embrace of the radical unscriptedness of the world. And as such, these are moments where even if you, uh, nobody, like, uh, no filmmaker would intend a random person to walk in and wash their pants in the rainwater in front of the characters, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, quite obviously that was, and especially with animals, Animals are deliciously disregardful of your designs. So very often you can shoot for 20 days and nothing will happen. And suddenly on the 21st day, a bird will take the glasses, a carton will move. And it's almost these kinds of like, you know, like life rewards you with accidents and contingencies. And um, it's really an, uh, the function of just showing up, you know, like that's what it really is. Thanks. Uh, you showed uh, in the film how the life of the brothers uh, essentially changed uh, after the New York Times article. Um, and uh, that happened, I guess, while you were filming. Are you still in touch with them? And how has their life changed after this film and the phenomenal reception that it's received can you so uh the um the story of the brothers and what happened afterwards is obviously a long tale of things because quite obviously the um uh what happens is that the film when it goes into that kind of stratosphere of you know the oscars etc it takes on a kind of life of its own that none of us could have predicted so i think the ethical uh, toolkit that we were trying to work with is that we um you know we 
essentially made sure that they were coming to every single big event, be it theatrical openings or big festivals. They came to Cannes, they came to all the awards, they came to BAFTA, obviously they came to the Oscars. And actually, Nadeem at this point has probably done more film festivals than I have. And the idea was, uh, you know, to also provide financial support, which they did. The producers funded the hospital for a year. So that's how we sort of like conducted the later part. And obviously there's a kind of, your life is bombarded by a kind of glitz and, you know, like pomp. And it's not easy in that, of course, the good things are that there's great attention to uh, detail. And uh, in the sense that the details of their life and their work gets there's a real media spotlight on it and uh, they did get a lot of uh, donations and so on but the truth is that it's not like one film can change your life in one fell swoop right so that and I, it would be foolhardy of me to say that the film just entirely it did I think alleviate their hardships for a year and a half but and I hope that it provided a kind of momentary oasis and the kind of witnessing of the singular lives that they lead and I think it helped in some things, but I would be uh, being disingenuous if I said that it completely changed their lives. Um, it's not just the kites. We have rodents, mosquitoes, minas, turtles, dogs, cats. I mean, mm. it's all that you find in, um, in a city as large and as at one level uh, filthy as Delhi is. And... Uh, What's the purpose in capturing that rawness? Well, um, it's partly what I said in answer to the first question, that the film had to kind of zoom out and become more than just um, a story about two brothers who save injured birds and take into account the broader ideas of um, simultaneity or... Uh, a kind of kinship or neighborliness or entanglement with non-human life. So therefore, you know, the litany of um, uh, of uh, of rats and snails and uh, uh, pigs and cats and all of that that you say to uh, try and kind of um, give a sense of this, like, you know, life writ large on the canvas of the city. And this broader sense of all that breeds. No, I was just wondering whether there was a linkage to the urban decay of urban ecology because air pollution is also a big theme uh, that is talked about. Urban ecology, conscious but of... not, uh, everything is conscious. There is nothing that has accidentally fallen into the film. Everything is utterly conscious, obviously. But uh, the... the the links were definitely there to urban ecology, but not just on the register of decay. Um, in that, I was also interested in this new form of literature that looks at the urban as a driver of uh, behavioral change, uh, ecological change, and actually uh, evolutionary change. You know, this whole idea that that which happens used to happen in uh, like 20 years is now getting accelerated and changes that are happening in literally two years, like you know, now there's a lot of scientific research that there are phenotype changes and so on. So for um, urban animals, so the same lizard, which has a certain grip of, say, in the urban spaces, its counterpart in rural spaces will have a different grip because the lizard is scaling buildings here. So we have to, like, you know, this sort of interest in the urban as a aggressive driver of um, ecology. And to think of... Uh, you know, think of wildlife occurring not somewhere far off in the jungles and forests or the seas or literally inside our body, but in the city. And the city is not being a kind of mutually exclusive category from nature, you know, as if nature takes place somewhere else and the city is isolated from it, which as we know is complete nonsense. So to think of the urban, both through the lens of decay, but also through the lens of improvisation because some animals have uh, really had a hard time because of the urban some have had really successful urban careers including the black kite and then we have to take that into account some relationships are playful some are you know cohabitational and some are uh, full of threat and it's a whole spectrum of things i have a follow-up question on that and uh you know those of us who work in wildlife and conservation we try very hard 
to you know build empathy um, for wildlife among regular people and the role of a film like this uh, is just phenomenal you know you watch a, a 90 minute film and you feel connected to those characters to the wildlife that you're showing to the urban wildlife uh, what's a little disappointing for me and maybe it's not fair to ask you this question is that the film didn't get a theatrical release you know it would be amazing if it could be shown you know in theaters maybe uh, you know across the country people who can't afford to watch it on ott because you know that would have made a huge impact it it undoubtedly would have having said that i mean i'm sure it's clear as day why not uh, the thing is that um, uh, the film released theatrically in a number of countries abroad but um, we knew that here it would be a better tack to release it in otts having said that let's be clear a uh, non fiction film usually does not get the kind of popularity and you know constituency that we got so i'm very grateful for the kind of numbers that we saw on social media also and uh, it basically meant that we were uh, going to get a kind of viewership and we weren't you know like we weren't we didn't have any complaints having said that the earlier bit of your this thing about how it moves audience i always had the ambition that uh, you know audiences should leave theaters and kind of look up you know the idea was to kind of enchant the skies and the thing is that films have the ability to be a kind of a trojan horse you know have a kind of to be where you sneak in conversations that audiences don't want to have and this is true for the political stuff that's at the background the social and political the socio political stuff also in the film wherein you can have a you know like you sneak in conversations and emotionally move people without it being pedantic and i usually dislike a lot of wildlife and nature documentaries like i have no patience with them because they're often very uh, screechy and pedantic and hold you by the collar and uh, you know like make you feel bad and uh, that really does i think more disservice than good the idea is to emotionally uh, you know tweak uh, so that you're not uh, you know conversations where you you're not just preaching to the choir but also having conversations with people who don't want to have that conversation essentially so to have tiny empathy plugs you know it, it, that's how films usually move when they get into the cultural bloodstream uh and like augment a kind of like pool of ideas that all of us are trying to sort of push towards right so uh just to follow up question uh was it a choice uh, at any point that you felt um you were making about certain politics that you chose to show in the film of course that was happening while you were filming um and so how much of it was a choice uh that you thought you know maybe if you drop that then it might get a theatrical release in india can you comment on that i mean firstly again everything is a choice nothing not a simple not a like a fraction of a second that you see in the film is not a choice <clears throat> the thing is that we when we went in we thought that the film would be purely ecological and philosophical and it's only after that as we all know the city of delhi was on the boil and we were going through, like the city was going through a really turbulent tumultuous time and the decision really was whether one points the camera streetwards or one sticks to the integrity of the lives of the brothers and we decided to do the latter and the point is not to crowbar one's own politics in or really you know like airdrop things that are not germane to the work that you're doing but we saw that basically the brothers were still picking up injured birds even in the midst of everything that was happening so it felt like uh, you know how they would witness it is a character would go to the balcony and uh, essentially you could hear the background murmurs of a restless crowd uh, you know so it, this is how you in slow dribbles you realize that the macro world is kind of leaking in in slow dribbles it's kind of hemorrhaging in as a background and so the so the social therefore instead of being seen frontally is being seen uh, obliquely and tangentially and i actually in hindsight prefer it like that instead of like being overly frontal and kind of like force fitting it in it's better when it's when you sense the social 
instead of being told it's better instead of like you know saying delhi 2020 you know it's like those texts coming and those kind of explanatory things coming when you're like asking the audience to be intelligent and empathetic and not hitting them on their heads with information and image is not illustrative but oblique it's always richer because it tends towards metaphor then now much of your time while filming was covid and then the delhi uh, violence and all of that did it make it more challenging for you to film uh, yeah i mean the covid time obviously like uh, life fully stopped but what it did was that it allowed me to read vociferously so that big pause became generative in the longer parable of the film in that i wasn't just impelled by the momentum of production but could stop and think so i think the film took on a more essayistic and thoughtful uh, uh i also had a kind of a personal loss i uh, lost a parent very suddenly so it, the film became more somber therefore you know like bits where a character says i think i'll die isi farsh mein girunga aur chhati fategi aur cheel and that's somber because it's happening in light of my own personal loss and the brothers and what happens is that your own life becomes fodder or material and illuminates that world and there's a kind of cross-pollination between your life and their life and the film became more somber in light of all the things that were happening through the course of the film while the brothers are clearly the heroes in some sense apart from the kites uh, did they also have some influence on uh, the final product I was, uh, you know, it, this is a thin line that you kind of, um, a tightrope that you walk, which is that whenever they're worried about any questions of safety, then I have to be super sensitive and I listen to them without any questions. However, I have to hold on to my editorial autonomy in that it's not like, you know, I'm not making a NGO film and it's not meant to be a hagiography. I have to hold on to my editorial autonomy. So if a brother says that I don't like how I'm, coming across in this fight, then I will hold on to the kernel of my sovereignty creatively and say that, no, I want to show it in this way. This is how I saw it. So you have to walk this balance of not being insensitive while at the same time staying true to the vision of what you witnessed. And what's the story on Salik? I mean, he, he seems to be the dose of humor. I mean, he's clearly very much part of the operation, but a lot of instances he adds humor to the narrative. Yeah, so he's a, a cousin and he's obviously very drawn by it. And the thing about him is that I feel like he really saved the film in that what happened was that um, I love the brothers Nadim and Saud and the kind of gravitas and depth and intellectual equity that they brought in. But having said that, the um, what happens is that they don't break a smile. You know, they don't they're just so self-serious people and after a while you just go you know it's like it there's a kind of it sags and you feel a bit you want a kind of sparkling effervescence and lo behold salik is the embodiment the epitome of you know the audiences are just so, so willing to grant laughter he comes on screen and you know everybody sort of lightens up and of course the darndest things happen to him like kites come and take off take his glasses off uh, he says the uh, bizarrest things. He'll randomly sit and say, Agar nuclear war hua to ka kya hoga. You know, it's like, and what it does is that, and you know, he actually has this kind of a slightly pristine, for the lack of a better word, and I mean this non patronizingly, innocence that uh, it, uh, you know, he, you trust him and you witness the world through him. So the truth is that he takes on the role of the audience, in a, of the viewer. Because you're seeing the world through his lens. And uh, he really sort of saved the film. That's why, in a way, he's on the cover. Because to me, he's the emotional heart of the film. Not to forget carrying a squirrel pup in his pocket. <laughs> exactly. Those are the things that keep happening. And, you know, with him, whenever he's on screen, uh, I, no matter where I'm screening in the world, you just keep hearing the soundtrack of, oh, ah, uh, or... You know, that, those are the things that you keep hearing, you know. So uh, he was absolutely crucial and he had a different relationship to the birds as well because the brothers are, you know, well-oiled machines now. He's not. And that therein lies a crucial difference. Uh, 
on Salik. When did he join the operation? How many from, years into from it? From the very beginning. Uh, oh, do you mean with oh. them? Uh, he oh. joined, I think, immediately after school. And when we started filming, he was already, you know, like uh, part of the establishment. Uh, so I think we are out of time for our questions and we want to give the audience also a chance to ask some questions. But a uh, closing question from me, uh, can you tell us about your upcoming next project? Sure. Uh, it's a fiction film, but I'm as interested in the world of the planet and biosphere. And I'm interested in the same questions of human non human entanglement. But by the end, I keep feeling that while I like all that breeds, it became a bit too sanguine and uh, laser focused on hope, which this film needed to be because it was their life. But I'm interested in the uncanny aspects of nature. Uh, so I'm trying to focus on uh, themes of eco-melancholia and a kind of eco-goth. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to think of for the next room. And my closing question, when did you know all that Preeti was going to be a success like this? I mean, the success and there's different levels of success. Not in my wildest dreams that I thought of uh, of the Oscars, obviously. And where does a Indian film think of, you know, like it's that really happens very once in a blue moon. And um, I, the top of my desire matrix was to be in either Cannes or Sundance. So I, that was like the cinephile self in me just wanted to be amongst that constellation of film directors and stars and so on. But and I just wanted the film to be seen. That's actually simply it. So after that, it takes on a kind of a delirium of its own and it uh, becomes some other kind of a uh, thing and which you both feel very grateful and proud about, but also um, feel um, that it's slightly exterior to you and the object that you thought you made. So psychologically, it feels like it's gotten not alienated, but exteriorized. And it feels like there's some kind of a arm's lengthness that you witness it from. And I'm sure this happens with anybody when suddenly something really big or really bad happens, right? It's true in moments of grief. It's true in moments of extreme sudden success that you feel out of body and disconnected or a kind of emotional dissociation with it. Thanks. Audience questions? Hello. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Hi, Shaunak. Hello. Uh, I just had a very, uh, it's not a very smart question. It's just something I've observed. So when I was watching Cities of Sleep and when I watched uh, All That Breathes, there's this thing that I have noticed in your filmmaking. Like there are elements of very philosophical insights from the characters, right? In All That Breathes, like you mentioned, they say that the will fall the will fall and the kites will fly out. Similarly, in Cities of Sleep, uh, we remember that, I don't remember the character's name, but we remember him saying um, very philosophical things about sleep and how it affects a person. So my yeah. question is, is this something that you look out for while, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. filmmaking or is it something that attracts you to capture life and document? It's, it's both. Uh, I mean, those two are obviously associated together. So the thing is that, I mean, obviously the joke in the crew is that uh, people are always going to be sif tumhe hi kaise these philosophers you seem to get but the uh, thing I is that, that 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 is why i asked this yeah question. yeah the thing is that that obviously has less to do um that has less to do with the world itself and more to do with me or our perspective which is that we are constantly like I am deeply interested in an inner life of mind and the conceptual and the philosophical and how it kind of stitches into the everyday and uh, different kinds of organic intellect. And uh, so I'm always on the... And so even if a character is not necessarily given to it in an obvious sense, I really push towards um, asking those questions to kind of like extract, uh, you know, that kind of like that corner of my subject's brain through the course of two, three years. So it's also about what you're trying to kind of dredge out. And over time, characters always understand what you're interested in, right? So they're also activating that part of them when they're talking to me, therefore. It's really about what part you want to uh, sketch out, uh, really. 
and i'm uh, interested in these things uh, so you know i feel like if if in anything from an expert i'm trying to not have a philosophical slant in an overt way in terms of characters voicing it out but in these two films you're correct in seeing it because that was really my interest um thank you so much shona for answering and also you're part of a very small minority that has seen series of sleep also so it's good to have a kind of uh, cross talk between the two uh hi shona uh the question i have is basically the you know the most beautiful thing in uh, in the, uh, i've seen in the all year is the uh, shot of the millipede going with the you know uh, plane in the puddle right and uh, i was reading a review of the film which you know i shouldn't talk to you about reviews but anyway uh, uh, it it compared that shot to a yanus kamenski shot right and similarly when the music we hear the synthy music it uh, starts to Uh, rise up, rise up until it is you know it's a at a deafening pitch, right? Uh, which is also something very similar to uh, you know uh, Zimmer and Gorenson's works, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. these uh, inspirations, right? Uh, so go on talking. I'm just putting. Uh, go. On, I'm just putting my charger in, so I'm hearing you. So you can go on talking. I'm just like uh, putting off the camera for a second. Uh, so these. Uh, inspirations right the, the the collaborators bring these inspirations or uh, uh, were you also involved in the uh, were you also uh, you know behind the idea of the millipede with the puddles and the music's deafening pitch um again i was behind every idea because i mean the whole team was behind every idea because obviously everything is like uh, thought through and belabored a million times over obviously um now the thing about the is the is the question why it was like why the music was like that or like is that the uh, main focus of the question uh yeah right so about the music i think uh, we worked with this uh, really wonderful uh, composer called roger gula uh, and the main sort of drive was that i wanted it to start as a kind of a fairy tale it had to feel like a fable and over time it had to feel like a fairy tale gone dark uh and that we had to achieve by the end by as a kind of um we were using distortions to kind of protract sound waves and you know like create undulating sound and we were we had picked up uh kite sounds like say claws or the ruffling of feathers or calls and so on and kind of like stretch them out into distortion uh sound waves so uh and th- th- you know that kind of protracted sound helps by the end i don't know if it i wouldn't call it a fever pitch but uh, this kind of distinction between a fairy tale strings based uh, initial thing and a kind of synth based thing at the end uh, seemed interesting so that was the uh, ambition in terms of that shot of the reflection of the plane you know I, we were shooting insects and at some point i realized that we were under a flight path so i then basically what i did was guys let's just wait for a plane so we just found a puddle and we waited for a day and a half for a plane to come and just kept doing it whenever we would hear a plane we would shoot it and then after a day of shooting at some point you will find uh, on take 40 you will find like you know uh, uh, the perfect combination of a uh, insect stepping out and just then the plane goes so that's really a question of patience and everything with animals is just like keep shooting and then something really cinematic will happen Uh, hi shonak um of course the uh, film is visually stunning but the most important part of the film for me was the soundscape uh, you know the azan i could hear the the news the way the news clip was uh, you know clips were being used uh, right. and of course the uh, things that you mentioned you know the sound of the cat all these things coming together that soundscape Uh, you know seamlessly weaves into the uh, you know visual narrative of this film but also right. stands independently i feel so i right. wanted to understand the process of you know building the soundscape that is independent at the same time you know uh, 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 you know complements the visual narrative of the film. right right thank you for that i think the sound often gets uh, neglected at the altar of the visual in the film and we worked very hard on the sound we had a f- fabulous uh, sound recorder and designer like same guy did the recording and the designing called niladri it was really spectacular uh, the film is you know with the animals especially sound is very important to make them feel alive and you know if there's an animal in the room you often hear it first before you you know you get aware of its 
uncanny presence if you just hear some rustling and then you look around right uh, so the uh, uh, the sound of the kites obviously you have to be very intricately done and so on but also create the sense of everydayness with the characters in that uh, you know it's like the sound of um, let me put it this way the whole film is structured through uh, a kind of succession of extreme compression and decompression we keep cutting from the very tiny claustrophobic basement to the open skies of the delhi uh, of delhi right so it's compression decompression a little like inhaling and exhaling right a little like breathing that's the structuring pattern of the film like compression decompression and when i say compression it's as much a function of sound as it is of the visual so for instance when i'm in the basement i can really lean in on the tele compactness but i also at the same time the compactness of the sound so the sound of or you know skin or clothes rustling or uh, chair all of that sort of makes it more tele or close up and makes you more intimate with the character if you hear the rustling of the shirt etc whereas if you cut from that to the sound of wind on sky you feel distant so these are the kinds of tricks that one usually deploys and sound is absolutely crucial to it so um uh, and we did fully for the sound because obviously a lot of the animal sounds we had to fully construct from scratch artificially because uh, when we're shooting the rats we can't go close to record right the beach was done in uh, fully in japan and then we did a um, mix in uh, uh, copenhagen and the sound we worked very hard on so uh, i always feel very happy when somebody likes the sound for like, because you know like with the rats in the the first shot for instance of the rats works primarily because of the um, sound because you need the, that kind of scatter of the sound because you need the sense of a um, uh, you know slightly um, visceral tactile presence even before you can tell that there are rats um, hi shanak um, i'm very curious to know what are the kind of conversations you've had with your cinematographers um like we, we, did you have did you have like a storyboard sort of thing to as as a guide or like h- how was the process well in documentaries you obviously can't have storyboards because you don't know what's going to happen but having said that the drift of your question is correct in that there was i wanted obviously to not make anything that looked like a regular documentary and it had to feel aestheticized controlled and um to some degree um cinematically controlled right so what we essentially did was basically if um, we placed two sliders uh, and then one two uh, tripods and a slider in the middle and the entire day we would just keep doing this slowly and over time you sort of get used to the intuitive rhythms and cadences of the space so even if a character is going that way the camera would slide here and it just would keep doing this and it creates this kind of a wavy kind of a movement and uh, we just spoke a lot about especially with ben bernhard the german cinematographer who sort of gave the main visual form of the film this w- I, the main thing i was telling him was that we have to think of simultaneity of human non human life so when you see a turtle uh, kind of moving through a pile of debris and you see traffic zipping past in the background for the that one shot kind of communicates simultaneity you know those two kinds of life forms temporality stapled together right within a city and there and so we wanted ways in which you reveal two aspects in one shot basically and you can only do this in two or three ways right you can either tilt you can either pan or you can shift focus right and we kept finding ways to slowly kind of like reveal things so that the ex- the final feeling should be that your vision gets expanded or augmented right and that was the uh, kind of main idea but the truth is we were watching a lot of fiction films it was um, the main reference point for instance in documentaries was somebody called viktor kosakovsky who's a phenomenal non fiction director i would recommend to everybody but otherwise we were also watching a lot of classics like uh, tarkovsky and uh, or now from like apichit pong and so on so to discuss constant camera styles etc so there was a lot of discussion about it no storyboarding but a lot of um, awareness of planning visual strategies okay next question for you shanak uh, 
how much of the non character by non character i mean the urban wildlife part of things was scripted for example you already mentioned the millipede and the aeroplane reflection of aeroplane going that was like take 40 or probably but even things like uh, there was a snail with fire in the background or the tortoise that you just mentioned with traffic in the background uh so i know you shot it for 3 years and while these things happen frequently to catch it on a camera is totally another ball game so how much of that was scripted or you just i don't want to say you just got lucky because i know it takes oh, but how, how do you mean scripted uh, i don't understand the usage of the word scripted here how do you script wildlife you pick up a tortoise and put it in front of a traffic to shoot how do you pick up a tortoise the thing is uh, you know we're not wildlife uh, um, uh, specialists or uh, we're not uh, you know like we nobody in the team had any experience or ambition in the nature of wildlife doc uh, so when you say a tortoise or a snail or any of this we wouldn't know where to find it right in the wild so basically we just uh, it really off the three years almost a year more than a year was just shooting life so which meant that you go to places wherever you go you'd say uh, yahan chuhe milte and you know like people would can always tell that like the rats are literally the hamdard chowk in old delhi and everybody would say there's a big nest there so you just go and uh, we shot that first opening shot for a week and after a while once you figured it out you just like you know you wait uh, for the right instance and if of course these things are not frequent but you 3 uh, years is a long time to make something frequent so i think uh, that's all the time we have and uh, it's been just amazing uh, talking to you shonak thank you so much for your time and uh, thanks to the organizers and to the wonderful audience i mean such fantastic questions uh, i hope it's been fun and uh, we have enjoyed it i hope you had a good time shona i i have uh, sorry for the interruptions and i really regret not coming for the festival uh, it would have been nice to talk to people with a special purchase in my life so uh, thank you so much for organizing this and this was very enjoyable have a good day everyone thank you thank you